Take it away. Yeah, hi. So yeah, my name is uh, Rodrigo Agundes, and welcome to Operation Tulip, so where we used deep learning models to automate um, the biggest uh, flower auction uh, house in the world. So a bit about me. So I have a background in uh, a PhD in theoretical physics. Um, yeah, I'm a data scientist, go data driven. But also, um, when I cross the border, I sort of I work with computers. Yeah, I tried the uh, data scientist uh, line, <laughs> but then it sort of uh, got me one hour extra. I'm originally from uh, from Tijuana, Mexico, so actually it's just really close here. Uh, but now I live in Amsterdam and work there, so I had to go like all the way around the wall, right, to to come back, sort of thing. Uh, yeah, and I'm a deep, deep learning enthusiast. Uh, uh, I do uh, workshops and uh, talks and also projects. So just a bit about uh, who I work for, Go Data Driven. So we're a data innovation consultancy. We're based in Amsterdam, and we have yeah, between some of the people that well, we helped is uh, Heineken, for example, where we help with uh, helping with making their beer with quality and nice color as well. So uh, you're welcome for that. <laughs> For those that you like Heineken. Yeah, ING, which is a bank, Air France, KLM, Unilever, Marktplatz, which is sort of the eBay in Amsterdam, so in the Netherlands, um, and Booking.com, and in this case, Royal Flora Holland, which is the biggest auctioneer of flowers in the world. So this more or less uh, will send the outline. So I'll focus a bit on trying to explain the actual AI use case that we're trying to solve here. Um, so what is the, pro the solution that we are trying to uh, to achieve that we proposed, uh, why we use transfer learning and deep learning for this specific problem, and a bit uh, talk about a bit uh, bottleneck features in transfer learning and how they can uh, allow you then to uh, optimize um, training time, but also inference. Uh, some of the tools we build, like Mariana, Eureka, and uh, Judy, uh, how we implemented uh, the feedback loop where, um, yeah, it's actually pretty, pretty nice. A bit about the architecture and some conclusion. So just a bit about, uh, so you get a um, sort of an idea of, of the problem. So Rhea Flora Holland is the world's biggest flower auction house, right? And I actually didn't know this before this project, but actually the flowers, are, most of them, like around the world, they actually fly to, to one of the auction houses, and then they get auctioned, and then they go fly back sometimes to the same place they came in. Um, but yeah, so, but it's the biggest one. So actually, the, I think the, uh, the, fa the sort of the, the, uh, the, f the factory that it's in Alsmere, so a uh, city in the Netherlands, I think is the, is the biggest building in the world by surface area. So it's like a huge operation. And is the, I think by land, uh, is the uh, land, land area, I think is the, like the fifth biggest. So they manage like a, like a bunch of volume. Uh, it's like uh, this company that is huge and never heard about it. And actually they date back to 1911 when they started. So this is not like a startup that you can just convince to use deep learning, right? That, that took some, some big fights. Uh, and they manage around 400,000 different types of plants and flowers that they auction. Uh, and during that, they manage around 26 million plants and flowers that are auctioned daily, daily, around, with around 100,000 transactions, uh, sort of uh, uh, daily as well. So during, during those 100,000 transactions, they sell around or uh, auction around 26 million plants and flowers daily. It's, it's like a huge uh, operation. So yeah, so a bit about the use case, how this actually works. So the growers or the sort of the companies that actually uh, produce the plants, they submit sort of, sort of metadata of the flowers together with pictures, right? So this goes into Royal Flora Holland servers, for example, which now they're hosted in uh, AWS. And uh, the moment that the auction actually happened, like the picture I showed before, like here, so then you see pictures there, right, with the flowers. So there actually some, there's some requirements for the picture. Right. And the volume is just so vast that it's impossible to check these pictures. So they have some, some of them have to have like a ruler so you can estimate the size of it. Um, some of them, uh, yeah, they have to become, come in a tray or in a bucket, etc. Some, some things like that. So this is more or less uh, one of the uh, auction houses. So how do you see it? You see even like the sort of the UI kind of thing is like very, uh, very kind of old school. Um, but whenever you get a picture sort of that doesn't comply with the requirements. 
So you can, the, the auction process, uh, like a sort of, it goes really fast, right? So the auction process got the throughput goes like really, really bad. So that basically be, means, uh, yeah, less, less uh, auctions that actually happen, which, yeah, it's, it's uh, I would say it's no bueno. Yeah, it's definitely not good. So, um, yeah, so things like that, or, or a picture can just come like upside down, right, and then appears in the screen. It's like just a disruption of your whole throughput uh, through your auction. But it goes really fast. Or something that is actually not a plant. And I, this has happened. Like people just sort of want to make fun of this process or something like that. And they just submit actually pictures that are not the plant. And it just appears because the volume is just so big that there's no way you can check it. So this is some of the examples of the requirements. So, so for example, uh, some of the plants need a ruler in it right, to actually estimate the size. So you don't get any actual surprise uh, when, you, when you get the flower back and, in your country or something like that. Uh, some of the flowers, if they are sold, for example, in a tray, the picture has to be shown in the tray, for example, right? Uh, and they need also, for example, like a back, white background. There, there are other requirements as well. So you can, you can think like the same picture needs several requirements. So in this case, yeah, it needs to have a ruler, it needs to have a tray, it needs to be a white background. And in this case, it also has to do a, a correct ratio. Like it cannot be like the whole white background and then the small picture uh, in it. So there are other uh, sort of business rules that the pictures need to comply. So this already sort of screams to you like this ruler thing, right? The ruler thing in the tray and also if it's a plant or not. And if it's not just a plant, but the plant that they're saying they're putting the product code for it, right? Uh, it screams to you deep learning, right? Because yeah, how else? Are you going to find features for this stuff? So what we want is sort of a gatekeeper, right? Sort of a bouncer that, that protects sort of this data once uh, that is flowing in, right? So we want to automate this, of course, right? So right now what they do is actually by hand. They say they, what they check is check a batch. So the auction process, let's say, happens, uh, I think it happens around uh, 8 in the morning or 6, something like that. And they start checking the pictures a batch around 4 in the morning, something like that. So then it's impossible they check, right, these 100,000 transactions. So we want to automate that, and it needs to scale. Um, yeah, so it also, um, uh, yeah, it needs to uh, sort of, if, if it's possible, so the bottom figure, so for example, to correct if possible, right? So for example, if you detect the rotation is not correct, right, instead of rejecting it, okay, trying to actually solve the problem, for example, if the picture is just too small within the ratio of the whole, uh, the whole picture, uh, maybe it does a, a, a sort of a crop of the picture and then resize it. Um, and the idea is also to give feedback, right? Because now what happens, I mean, you're talking about clients of these flowers that are, I don't know, how, how old. So when you sort of reject their submissions for their auction, at the moment it's not rejected, so they get at the last of the queue within the auction. So they, yeah, you can understand that then they get an interesting call with the account manager. And uh, so they need a feedback, right? Like why? why? Why is this happening so I can correct it? Um, and the best idea would be if they get a real time, right? Like I submit and I get a real time why am I being rejected? Um, so there are several use cases that actually uh, come from this for actually solving this, right? So one is helping the quality team. So basically just increase the quality of the auction process itself. Also, because you are sort of adding tags to the pictures, so let's say, for example, now I know that the picture includes a ruler, includes a tray, is this type of picture. So now I can expose an API for, let's say, a third-party vendor that just basically filters using the tag. And then it just gets them the, the plans or whatever types that he, he, uh, he wants. Um, the idea is also to get this photo app, to get this real time, so that you can now, it can tell you, no, you're missing this or that. Um, yeah, and the potential future is for service for, for third parties that just plug in their sort of their marketplace or something like this for flowers. So it's a huge sort of uh, advantage for them. Um, so just, just to uh, make clear, so yeah, we need to automate this. Yeah, we need to basically have uh, a way to give feedback, to solve, but most importantly is to be able to tell from all these different sort of tags from the picture. This is some of them, uh, if it's a plant, uh, plant or not, if it's actually the plant that they're saying, the proportion, the rotation, the ruler, et cetera. So yeah, like we said, yeah, we proposed sort of 
using deep learning for this, and I also I couldn't imagine any other way to do it. Um, most of the, of the requirements are checked by a uh, deep learning model, not all of them. And just a general advice is like if, yeah, deep learning shouldn't be used for everything, right? There are some heuristics that actually solve things pretty, pretty quickly and pretty easily. Like for example, for checking the, the background image, what we do is sample pixels from the image and then we basically form a, a probability distribution and then we make a decision of it. So that's a heuristic kind of thing, right? Uh, but for all the, uh, most of the other stuff, yeah, there's, I, don't, I don't know how, how else to do it. Um, and yeah, just a glimpse of the whole architecture. We actually came up now uh, with a quite mature uh, uh, product or, or solution, I will say. Um, I will explain some of the parts that this has, right? But everything is in AWS. Yeah, so, so the idea is to use transfer learning. Maybe most of you are already familiar. I've heard it in the talk several times, also in the talk that it was previous to me. And uh, so the idea basically is to recycle, right, these state-of-the-art trained models, right, and uh, use it for your use case, basically. So within, uh, within Keras, right, uh, you have this for image recognition, at least, because you also have em trained embeddings for text. You can leverage these models that were trained by, uh, by other companies, uh, and are very, they are very powerful, that if you try to do it yourself, yeah, yeah, good luck with that, or unless you will spend, uh, burn a lot of money. Um, so some of these models are just available for you. And uh, in, gen in particular, we use BGG16, yeah, also uh, I think the previous talk uh, was mentioning as well. Um, and it's just basically a bunch of smart convolutions that are glued together. Um, so that's the one we use, but you also have, for example, ResNet, right, which is basically uh, sort of a, a smart way to propagate the output, like a few steps up, uh, in front. And Inception V3 also, that's pretty nice, which actually uh, uh, addresses a problem like when you do convolutional layers, you sort of have to decide, okay, how am I going to, uh, which type of convolution am I gonna, am I gonna choose? So they have these sort of um, uh, Inception modules here that these ones, like, they're just repeated, where they say, okay, we're gonna do this one, this one, and this one, and then we just basically concatenate. So to do that yourself is just, like, insane. So now the idea is, yeah, that we can leverage this power, right, of transfer learning. We output our, 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 our images, and then it basically tell us whatever uh, we are wanting to predict. Now, what is the idea of this transfer learning? So the idea is that, okay, we're gonna remove the last layers, right, with the, actually the, the ones that make the prediction, right? So this softmax uh, soft uh, layer, and uh, I think there's a dropout in there as well, and a, um, a global average pooling as well. So that we sort of, sort of we cut it, right? And then we say, okay, we're gonna actually retrain that, but we're gonna reuse the, the other part. And the idea is that the other part is basically has the concept of low level uh, structures in your image, like lines or, or circles or a bit more uh, low level structures. And then at the end, you sort of retrain just to predict the ones, uh, the things that you actually want. Now, okay, so normally you, you can do this, right? It's just a sort of, you, it's very easy in Keras. So you basically just so, so, sort of import whatever and then so include top false. And that basically gives you, uh, gives you back the gray part and then you add yourself these green layers. So for most of the models, it was just enough to add two to three layers. That was more enough to actually get a good prediction. So if you're actually gonna do this, just go little by little because you're already leveraging a quite powerful uh, system. It's most of the time not gonna be needed to, to have a lot uh, on top. So what is this concept about bottleneck features? Maybe you also have heard about it. It has to do also with transfer learning. And the idea is that so instead of every time we pass the, the, uh, the image through the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the pipeline of the model, we actually sort of save whatever comes out of that uh, pre-trained part. So we actually save those, right? And why, why do you save that? So those are called the bottleneck features because then you basically can just load, the, load this and just, just retrain this part. So at training time, every picture doesn't have to travel the whole pipeline but you start just from the bottleneck features, and re that really reduces your time for training. Really, like, a lot. Uh, and, uh, and then just you retrain these two, three layers, because you already struck the bottleneck feature. So there's, like, an intermediate step. So for training, I would definitely recommend you, if you're gonna 
uh, have transfer learning, just, just do this. Because then when you retrain the next day, the, the bottleneck features are already there, of course. So what that, the bottleneck features also allows you to do, right? Now let's say we're doing inference. So I have an image, and I want to predict several things, right? So if you don't, if, if the normal, or the sort, of, sort of the, the sort of naive way of doing it is just you, you train this model, the full model, and you will have to pipe it in, in a way like this, right? Which is, the, you're repeating exactly the same sort of model that you didn't train on, that it was the, the weights were frozen, like several times. But if you do the, the bottleneck features, you can do something like this, right? So that reduces your inference time like by a, a big degree. So right, I think this is sharing around, uh, you save around 98% of the weights that are actually, uh, the multiplication that you have to go through. So that's actually what we do, right? And that improves a lot uh, sort of the performance, sort of the takeaway, I will say, from, from what I'm showing. Um, yeah, so uh, we also, uh, so in order to encapsulate sort of the actual uh, deep learning models, we, um, yeah, it was created this uh, tool that is called, uh, we call Mariana, which basically uh, uses a command line tool, which uh, leverage uh, Keras and TensorFlow, basically to load these, 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 uh, these modules, this transfer learning. And then when the pictures get in, right, they go into this uh, sort of bottleneck, and then, and then you have the, your layers that were trained uh, for the particular task. Uh, then we have this other uh, module, which is called uh, Eureka, uh, for heuristics, of course. And that's basically what I said. So there's some, um, so this, this sort of heuristic of sampling the picture and then building a probability distribution to say, okay, we're sure that the background is white or not. So at the end, we put all these together and we uh, put it together, all the models in what we called uh, iMagical, right? So this is basically in a container, in a Docker container, which is gonna get triggered for whatever pictures you want. Um, it's part of the architecture that I show there. Gonna, you're gonna see it again. So basically the pictures come in, right? And then they go into the command line uh, uh, Mariana uh, uh, package. And then you go to Eureka, and then basically calls an iMagical to actually make the predictions. Uh, and then we, uh, we have what we call our Judge Judy. <laughs> so that's, um, yeah, that's funny for me. And um, so basically the idea from Judge Judy is that it's an intermediary between the picture and the product code that, the, that they're submitting and the actual, and the predictions that, um, that are given by iMagical. So Judge Judy pulls the requirements, right? So you're submitting something, you say this is product code, blah, blah, blah. So what Judy does, it goes and pulls the requirements for that picture, then gets the results from iMagical, and then based on some business rules, makes, makes a decision, right? So that's more or less how the flow goes. And then the decision is, okay, you know, uh, I flag it or I don't flag it. Now, the advantage that you have with this, and I think also uh, Andre, Andre uh, Benaki was uh, mentioning uh, in his Tesla uh, thing, is that once you flag it, then these batches that the quality team is reviewing you can send exactly these ones, right, which are sort of the problematic ones. So they're not, they don't check the ones that are your, I don't know, 99.9% .9 that they're correct, which is basically loose time for these people because it's manual work. So he was mentioning the same thing, right? Like we, uh, you, now once you have this model in place, you can actually say this, these are the pictures or these are the actual data set that I want you to check because are, those are the problematic. And that gives a sort of a really nice flow because now you're basically increasing your data set and improving now your models. So this is what we, uh, we implemented uh, for the feedback loop. So yeah, uh, I give you the quality control, uh, <laughs> quality control group. So basically they actually check, uh, we build this sort of uh, this excellent tool. So they get it there in their, in their laptops, just, just, uh, yeah, just, just here, and they basically um, go through the inventory. So they actually have the plants also there, like I said, it's not only the pictures, they actually, the plants have to be there, and the sort of metadata sometimes of the pictures, so it also includes some metadata of them. But what happens here is that, so Judy makes this decision, right, a flag it or not flag it. So then Judy basically pulls, puts into uh, this excellent tool for the quality team, so the predictions that I came. And then the quality team basically has just enough to say, yeah, this is correct or not correct. If they agree, for example, for whatever, uh, or disagree, they just change this button, 
And then we have this other sort of uh, uh, a part of the architecture we call Vogue, which actually makes sure that your training set, it's a quality training set, right? So what happens there uh, is that they basically say yes or no, and then Vogue makes sure that these, now this data becomes now part in, an, now is, it flows to S3, to an S3 bucket, and now this becomes now your training set. And whenever you trigger, again, your training, right, now you can, you can basically just get whatever is an S3. And now you have sort of the full loop, right? And, and once you get to a certain uh, precision or accuracy, we already are leveraging more than 90, 95% for all the models. Uh, you can have sort of a, a, a nice sort of improvement of your data set, especially for uh, yeah, plans that are extremely difficult to, to, uh, to sort of uh, categorize or something like that. So then you have now, maybe now it's, maybe now it's uh, a bit more understandable, right? So we have here uh, basically Mariana and Eureka, right, which, which will get triggered by airflow. I think we're all familiar with that. And now, but what this does basically pulls the data from S3, which are the bottleneck features, right? And then basically what it does, it trains the model, right? It's pretty fast. And saves the model in Art Factory, which is also part of the uh, AWS. And basically uh, what happens whenever there's this, this API call here, they basically, Judy pulls the requirements, calls iMagical, iMagical pulls, the, pulls the, uh, the model, and makes basically the inference. And now once you have that, then the excellent team, right? This is the people that I show you that were checking, basically pulls whatever Judy uh, says it does, uh, they make this check, and then Vogue makes, makes sure to put back now these sort of, in, these pictures that came in to put them back into the training set. And if they're not, they go into Dynamo because we don't want to make, they go in a separate sort of, because we don't want them to make of the data set, right? Because then you're sort of gonna bias yourself by getting the results from the, from, from the, uh, from the model without having a review. And then by doing this architecture, so now you can have sort of the third party vendors also, which can just plug into your, to your API if you expose it. So there is also a nice, uh, so the load, how the load uh, hits the, uh, the Royal Flora Holland when they're submitting, so it's actually quite imbalanced through the day. So the idea is, okay, you can have a, a super uh, a big machine, of course, which does things inference very fast, but then of course you will have to have it on 24 seven, right? So it's a bit costly. And as lower you go, so less, less uh, smaller machines, uh, then you can adapt to the load much better, right? And, and it is very abrupt, there's a peak, a peak uh, I think around like 10 a.m. or something like that. So we made a sort of a benchmark of different, uh, uh, yeah, different types in, 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 uh, in AWS, right? Just to measure performance. And if we're gonna serve this real time uh, service, for example, there is becomes really important you have an inference time at least below 300 milliseconds, at least. So, uh, and then why, once we do that, yeah, we study more or less, yeah, for the business, yeah, how much actually this is gonna cost based on the, on the influx that you're gonna have, which I would advise everybody to do in order, if you want to convince people to, or at least a company that comes from 1911, to convince them to use deep learning, you need to have this sort of, uh, this sort of data. So, just sort of as a conclusion, uh, yeah, I think we managed to have a quite mature solution and a, a, an automation for this process that, at least for the people that we bring the solution to, was an eye-opening. We leverage performance up to 95%, which is actually, yeah, quite, I would say quite impressive for, uh, for the amount of volume and the different type of pictures that we get. Uh, and yeah, we also implemented deep learning and not forget also the heuristics, huh? because uh, yeah, I know deep learning is the boom, but uh, sometimes heuristic is just enough and cheaper. Um, and the feedback loop, which I think is, uh, is also pretty nice. So just a small thing, so the gang is basically the, the lead data scientist on this project was Vincent, so he's a colleague of mine. Andrews Nair, data engineer, which basically is, uh, I don't know, he's like, he knows everything about data engineer. He's, I don't know how he does it. And uh, Dirk, uh, which is a data scientist actually for Roya Flora Holland, which took basically what uh, Vincent did and sort of integrate these services together. And uh, special thanks <laughs> to Niels. So actually, we started this project around one year and two months ago or something like that. And he was not the CTO then, but I think he had like free time, so he helped 
labeled uh, the ruler thing, which was for the POC, and now he's the CTO. So maybe I should uh, start uh, <laughs> go to Mechanical Turks or something, uh, something like that. But yeah, that's it. And you have more uh, technical questions, of course, uh, you can come to me or, or ping me in, uh, in Twitter. And yeah, thank you very much for your attention. All right, I think we have uh, time for just a couple of questions. Um, yeah, four minutes or so. Hi, how many classes are you predicting in your models? Yeah, so, uh, so each of the models uh, from the deep learning, there's just basically yes or no. So it's a binary classification, but there are 10 models. But each of the models is just a binary. So if it has a ruler or not, yeah. But it's more the, um, we're more than interested on the yes or no, we're interested more in the probability. And then Judge Judy makes the call based on what we've seen uh, before or the business, uh, business rules. That's more important for us. Hi. Uh, how did you customize the model? Yeah. You, and in addition to that, um, you are not using a distributed uh, layer, right? Uh, no, no. So uh, right now, OK, first question. So how do we uh, customize the model? You mean the transfer learning model, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So the idea is that once you, once you obtain these bottleneck features, right, you can sort of forget that there was ever a deep learning model there. And now you can sort of start from scratch. But now you're not going to use the picture, but you're going to use the bottleneck features that you actually uh, obtained. And now you retrain your, your, uh, uh, your new deep learning, let's say, uh, uh, model uh, for whatever uh, task you want. So you just retrain on, on that specific task. So you do need to have labels for each of these tasks, right? You need, like I said, about this ruler or not, uh, about the plants or not, and which plant it is, for example. So you do need to have sort of a specific model for each of these cases. But you, because of, but I want to maybe repeat, but because of these bottleneck features thing, you can sort of get them and then sort of forget that there was ever a deep learning model there. So that, that I think that's a, that's a quite a nice thing. And then the other one, uh, no, at the moment, uh, no, no distributed. I think for hyperparameters, there was the idea to tune this uh, by doing that. But since we're still sort of in the evaluation process, right? Uh, it's not yet part of the architecture. Uh, just a quick question about the, uh, right here, sorry. Oh, uh, like sorry, what? I should have stood up. No problem. Um, just a question about the architecture you chose. Yeah. Um, did you consider something along the lines of UNet because of the localization that's required? Yeah, uh, you mean uh, UNet? UNet? UNet, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so no, no, we did not. I think for the, so actually, um, uh, here my colleague actually that is, that is here, we've used, uh, well he has used a uh, unit for uh, MRI data of the heart. So that's more like segmentation when you want to like segment. So perhaps for the background thing, like if you would like to like over, uh, like over uh, engineer this, yeah, you could have a segmentation of the actual plant and then make a ratio of it. For that case I can imagine it, but for telling if it's a plant or not, I find it not so useful for example. Yeah, yeah, good. Per How do you solve the problem with the localization of, say, the ruler versus where the pots are? Um, is there some other localization technique that you use in your CNN, or? So, I, so, yeah, that's a good question. But I think because of the type of object that a ruler is, so basically it's a, it's, a, it's a rectangle, that sort of helps a lot to localize it. And so once you use your, uh, your convolutional layers, it's not difficult to capture these sort of stuff. If, if the ruler can, could have like, like strange, very strange shapes. So for example, there's, uh, there's a case where they're actually putting also advertisement on the pictures, that, so they shouldn't do that. But the advertisement can come in different shapes. So that is much more difficult if it's just sort of a rectangle. So that's pretty much captured by the pre-trained model. But yeah, good question about that. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but if you have any more questions, please, uh, please catch uh, no, please do. Rodrigo uh, outside. No. Thank you again.